Normally, I like to trace the theology or the, or the moral story uh, in a book, but Daniel, I couldn't help. Inevitably, I kept coming back to dates. To me, uh, most of the people lay out Daniel chapters 1 through 7, and then the second half, chapter 8 through 12, and that's the typical way. But I couldn't help but follow the dates because um, Daniel chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 8, 9, and 10 always tell you what year of the king uh, that chapter is set in. And so I could not help but uh, organize Daniel by the dates of each chapter. And what you'll find is um, following Daniel by the dates of each chapter makes it fascinating to understand why that particular chapter might have been written. So that's what we're going to do. We'll go through. Let me give you the background in order to get into the book of Daniel. Um, you've got Medes and the Babylonians are forming alliances and they are fighting against Assyria. Assyria is losing, and so these, these kings from Assyria keep running away, and they end up at a place called Carchemish. Carchemish is way up at the top of Palestine. So this body of land, Palestine, Judea, Carchemish is way up at the top. And they're all, Egypt is going up to fight there, and the Assyrians have gone over, and they're trying to fight there as well. So Egypt goes up in 609, King Necho II goes up to, uh, from Egypt up to Carchemish to help, As to help Assyria fight against the Babylonians. And here's the weirdest thing of all, this is in 2 Kings chapters 24 and 25, Josiah decides to go out and get involved. It's really weird, and I, I won't go into too much detail because there's too much, but Josiah goes to get involved, and you can read this, 2 Kings 24, 25, and uh, King Necho from Egypt says, hey, what are you doing? What are you doing, Josiah? This is not your battle. God has told us to go up and fight this war. So leave us alone or you're going to be fighting against God. Now that's King Necho from Egypt that God had spoken to. So Josiah throws down. So Necho kills him. Josiah is gone, the best king that, uh, or the, 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 the king that was revitalizing the spirit of Jerusalem. After that, Nico goes on up to Carchemish and he blasts the Babylonians. So uh, Nico comes on back down, and as he's on his way back down to Egypt, he has to travel right through Palestine. It's interesting about where God put Palestine because anybody that owned that area, that area between Carchemish and Egypt, owned the major uh, highway between the world powers. So everybody was always fighting for that section of land. Uh, this guy's going back down to Egypt, but as he's going back down to Egypt, he remembers, oh yeah, that dude from Jerusalem kind of ticked me off. So he goes into Jerusalem and grabs his son, which is Jehoahaz. He's leading. So Necho the Egyptian grabs Jehoahaz, takes him into captivity down in Egypt, never hear of Jehoahaz again. Now Jehoiakim is the new guy in Jerusalem. Habakkuk the prophet around 608 is witnessing Egypt taking over parts of Jerusalem and that's when Habakkuk writes his uh, book and he's crying out to God saying, how can you do this God? How can you let people more evil than Jerusalem be the ones to come discipline Jerusalem? How can you let that happen God? So that's where Habakkuk falls. A few years later, um, a new king in, Neb in uh, Babylonia, his name is Nebuchadnezzar. And his dad is the one that got whooped by the Egyptians up at Carchemish. So Nebuchadnezzar says, you know what? I'm going to go teach those Egyptians a lesson. He goes to Carchemish and defeats the Egyptians that are in Carchemish. While he's up there fighting, he figures, you know what? I'm going to go on down to Egypt and just crush my way down to Egypt. Um, <clears throat> heads down to Egypt stops by Jerusalem and says, by the way, guys, I'm about to go conquer Egypt. You would be smart to change sides and be on my side. So Jerusalem flips, and now they're on Babylon's side, no, no choice of their own. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar goes down, conquers Egypt, but while he's in Egypt, he gets word that his father, the one that got whooped the first time, is dead. Now, you know, as soon as a king dies... Uh, the successor better be there in a short amount of time or somebody else is going to step in as the successor. So Nebuchadnezzar is rushing back to Babylon. Well, once again, he's got to go through that Palestinian area and he thinks, well, in order, when I show up back at Babylon, how great would it be if I show up with the spoils of war? 
So he goes through Jerusalem, swipes up Jehoiakim, as well as a lot of the gold from the temple, and that's all the one percenters that I talked about the last time. Daniel is included in that group. So Nebuchadnezzar goes back to Babylon, and Daniel is in that group, and that is where the book of Daniel starts, chapter 1 and verse 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave Jehoiakim in, uh, into the hands of uh, him. They took him back to Shinar. Shinar is a great word to recognize because Shinar, um, the Chaldees, ooh, I'm going to spell that one wrong. But anyway, Chaldees, Babylon, Babel. Um, remember, uh, Abraham came from where? Yeah. Ur of the Chaldees. Okay. All of these are the same place. So Jerusalem is going to be exiled right back down to where it all started with Abraham when God promised to give them the promised land. So that brings us right into Daniel chapter 1. Chapter 1 was Daniel and his friends. You know that they object to the king's food. And uh, one of the main things that I was attracted to in chapter 1, um, look at verse 8 in Daniel chapter 1. Uh, so they're in Babylon. What can you do? They're going to get enrolled in Babylonian school. They're going to learn um, um, the Babylonian language. Babylonian literature, but the one thing that Daniel did, chapter, or chapter 1 and verse 8, Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food. If there's a little a theological lesson there, I got to be somewhere I don't want to be, but I can determine for myself that I won't defile myself by becoming like these people. So Daniel determined that. Strange that Daniel would resist the king's food after the king just conquered his country. Right, So there's something very profound about the amount of faith that Daniel has in his God to resist this new king. Part of the story there. God blesses Daniel in this case for taking his stance um, against the tyranny of the king. Look down at uh, chapter 1 and verse 20. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the queen and king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in the kingdom. And then he's going to end chapter 1 by saying, Daniel was there until the reign of King Cyrus. So chapter 1 was kind of just like a real quick summary. Year 1 of Babylon, learns from the Babylonian schools, boom, he's there all the way until Cyrus. That's the end of chapter 1. When we get into chapter 2, uh-huh. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah, this is definitely a story of the sovereignty of God. And I couldn't help but think, guys, with the sermon, we were talking about witnessing to the world. And sometimes there is that tendency to gauge whether or not I should speak out at this moment or not. And I'm very conscious of Daniel. Every time Daniel took his stance, God blessed it and the nation exalted him. So it's not always that taking a stance for God can get you into trouble. Somebody may just respect your stance for God. That's what we see in Daniel's story there. Section 2 through 7 is very unique, guys, because chapters, I mean, chapter 2 right here, all the way down through chapter 7, and this will make a difference in how we understand the text. Um, all of this is written in Aramaic. Very interesting. Chapter 1 was written in Hebrew for the Jews. Chapters 2 through 7 are written in Aramaic, which what, te what that tells us is God wants the world abroad to understand his message in this part of the book. So this is not only for the Jews, this is for um, all the Chaldeans that speak Aramaic. So I'm going to treat that as a section. Uh, the first thing we see in chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, and we're familiar with that dream. He sees the big statue, the head of gold, the chest of silver, the waist of bronze, and the legs. And Daniel explains the dream and says that these are four kingdoms. 
Another kingdom is going to rise up and defeat you. Somebody's going to rise up and defeat them. And then finally, a Roman kingdom is going to come. Chapter 2 and verse 10, uh, what's interesting here is first, the Chaldeans themselves become exasperated. Chapter 2 and verse 10, the Chaldeans, Chaldeans is the same as Babylonians. It's synonym. Uh, they answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand. No great and powerful king has asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter of a Chaldean. The thing that the king asks is difficult, and no one can show it to the king except for the gods, whose dwelling is not with flesh. Interesting insight into their perspective of their gods. They don't have anything to do with the, the, the people of the flesh. So first, it's unanimous. That's impossible. Nobody can do that. And then, of course, uh, Daniel shows up, and I love the way Daniel introduces the dream, says uh, in verse 20 there. Daniel said, Blessed is the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes the times and the seasons. He removes the kings and he sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. God, Daniel had complete faith in God. Gave him all the credit for all of this. He interprets the dream and uh, really of main interest for us is the idea that during the time of that fourth kingdom, which we interpret as the Roman kingdom, a rock will come. That rock smashes down this big statue and that rock slowly becomes a mountain. In biblical language, something being a mountain, Babylon was called a great mountain. Uh, a mountain is a kingdom. So he's saying that this rock that smashes these four kingdoms is going to become a kingdom itself. Interesting that a rock is what breaks the statue down. Jesus was called the stone that makes men stumble, um, the rock of offense, and the chief cornerstone of um, the church. And so we take that to be Jesus and the kingdom being the church. In chapter 3, Nebuchadnezzar has another dream. He sees, uh, no, sorry, not a dream. Nebuchadnezzar, we find out that Nebuchadnezzar must have misunderstood his position as this statue because he decides to go make a golden statue that is uh, 60 cubits tall and a cubit is um, one and a half feet. So this is a nine, no, sorry, 90 feet high. 60 cubits, 90 feet high. This is a nine-story golden image. Uh, I imagine that was a massive presence there. So he makes this image, and we know the story, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Everybody has to bend down and uh, worship this image. Kind of reminds us of Revelation, doesn't it? Anybody that does not worship the image will be killed. So we've already seen that happen multiple times throughout history. Uh, chapter 3 and verse 17, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego uh, have the same faith as Daniel, and they say, if this be so, uh, Nebuchadnezzar is going to threaten to kill them, and they say, well, if this is so, the God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. Complete faith. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods, or worship the gold image that you have set up. Uh, we can tell that Daniel's friends here had obviously determined themselves to never be defiled, to stay true to God. And so that's what we see there. Nebuchadnezzar, actually, you would think that uh, this could turn out really bad. But in the end, chapter 3 and verse 28, Nebuchadnezzar answered, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel delivered his servants, trusted in him. They set aside the king's command and they yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except for their own. These three guys get promoted uh, in Babylon. And then a little bit of background for chapter 4. Uh, in the meantime here, by the time we get to chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar has been going, I think this was 580, yeah, 586. Right about in here is 586 B.C. Nebuchadnezzar had been sending um, uh, troops over to continue 
keeping Jerusalem in check and slowly bringing back the exiles from Jerusalem. 586 is the last trip Nebuchadnezzar makes to Jerusalem. He brings with him the last of the exiles, and in 586 is when he breaks down the walls of Jerusalem, breaks down the temple, and burns all the houses. What's really interesting, uh, part of the backdrop here, there's not going to be any king in Jerusalem anymore, and Jeremiah mm -hmm. is there in Jerusalem. Jeremiah has uh, had some fame and some respect as a prophet of God, and so when Nebuchadnezzar goes to Jerusalem this last time, he gives Jeremiah the choice. Jeremiah, you have a choice. Would you like to stay in Jerusalem or would you like to come back to Babylon with us? You just have to see God's hand on that. Jeremiah chooses to stay in Jerusalem and it's during that time when Jeremiah stays in Jerusalem and he witnesses Jerusalem burning down that Jeremiah writes the book of Lamentations, the burning down of Jerusalem, which he witnesses. <clears throat> now, by this time, we got to realize with the defeat of Jerusalem, Nebuchadnezzar now, this young king, an older guy now, he's had his victory in Carchemish. He's had his victory against the Assyrians. He's had his victory against Egypt, which was the greatest power of the time. He's had his victory against Egypt. He's conquered uh, Jerusalem. Ne Nebuchadnezzar was known as the greatest ruler up to this point to ever have lived. So he's got to be feeling pretty good about himself. A little background to Babylon. Uh, the city of Babylon was one of the seventh wonders of the world. Did you guys know that? It's considered one of the seventh wonders of the world. Babylon was a completely flat desert area, and the river Euphrates flowed right through it. He married a girl, I think she was a Mede, and the Median territory up in the north was very mountainous. So I picture like our Chinook Pass over that way. Very mountainous. His wife gets homesick because they're living out in a flat desert. So Nebuchadnezzar takes it upon himself to build cities going up like mountains. So that when she would see Babylon, she would see these cities built up like mountains. And all the gardens and forestry that he tried to incorporate out of what used to be a flat desert. So he made a city that looked mountainous um, at a place where it used to be flat desert. Three square miles was the city, and the river Euphrates flowed right through the middle of it. So he's done some awesome accomplishments. Isaiah says, uh, Isaiah 13 says that uh, Babylon was the glory of all kingdoms. Jeremiah 51 says that Babylon was the praise of the whole earth. Uh, and Isaiah 47, uh, he prophesies the, the falling, the destruction of Babylon. And he says, O virgin daughter, come sit in the dust. No longer will you sit on a throne. And he said that Babylon was called a virgin daughter because Va Babylon had never been ravaged. Nobody had ever been able to invade Babylon. So pretty big deal. Uh, the Greek historian Herodotus said that the Babylonian walls were 350 feet high. That's 35 stories, right? 35 story, 350 feet. 10 feet is one story. 35 stories tall were the walls in Babylon. 75 feet thick were the walls. Um, Isaiah spoke of the Babylon as having doors of brass, and Herodotus said that there were hundreds of brass gates in the walls. So Nebuchadnezzar is full of himself, and we think that it's right about this time in 584. We'll give him a couple years. In 584, Nebuchadnezzar gets this dream about a gigantic tree that reaches up to the sky. Chapter 4, sees this giant tree that reaches up into the sky. Chapter 4 and verse 25. You shall be driven amongst men, and you'll dwell with the beasts of the field. You'll be made to eat grass like ox, and you shall be wet with dew. Seven periods of time will pass over for you, and you will know that the Most High is the one who rules the kingdom of men. Can't you just see that Nebuchadnezzar has gotten a little too full of himself? And so he gets this vision of this tree, and somebody cuts down this awesome, awesome, massive tree. And that's the idea that God is going to cut uh, Nebuchadnezzar down unless Nebuchadnezzar humbles himself and realizes who the true power is. It's not you, Nebuchadnezzar. It's God. 
Nebuchadnezzar doesn't pay attention. He goes senile for a period of time. And uh, eventually he comes back, uh, gets his senses back, and we read in chapter 4 and verse 4, I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven. All his works are right, all his ways are just, and those who walk with pride he humbles. So did Nebuchadnezzar learn his lesson? Yeah, he gives credence to the God of heaven saying that is the one who is all-powerful. After that, we don't hear much. Nebuchadnezzar is going to die in 562, and there are several Babylonian kings that um, come into play before Belshazzar. Belshazzar is the next Babylonian king we see, but a lot of years pass here. There are several kings, evil Marduk and uh, some other guys. Uh, but this one guy named uh, Nabonidus, Nabonidus becomes a king after this tree dream, and then for some reason, Nabonidus decides to go off to Arabia for 10 years. This isn't in the Bible. This is just historical. Nabonidus goes to Arabia for 10 years. While he's in Arabia, he leaves his son, Belshazzar, in charge. And that brings us to the next section of our story, chapter 5. <clears throat> Meanwhile, while all this is happening, the Medes and the Persians are up here in the north and they're allying with each other and they're building up strength. Nabonidus uh, returns from Arabia in 543. So I'm going to see this here. 543, Nabonidus returns. So by this time, Nabonidus is back in Babylon and so is Belshazzar. And I think there's something real interesting when we read the story now. Daniel chapter 5, verse 22 uh, you guys remember the story? They're all celebrating, partying, dancing, drinking, and a finger comes out and writes on the wall, uh, many, many, tekel, perez, something close to that. They don't know what it means, and so they send for Daniel to explain what this thing, this writing means. Uh, it's very interesting um, that there's a play on words, uh, the many, many, tekel, uh, I didn't write it down whatever the other word is, par par parson. And basically it means uh, you're going to get kicked off the throne, but, and I can't duplicate it in, in English, uh, but at the same time that it was criticizing him getting kicked off the throne, each one of those represents a number. The first one was 60. The second one was one. Okay, mene was 60. What's the second one? Mene, tekel is uh is one and then parson parson i think is the other one parson it means to split something in half and so even though that had an, uh, an equivalent which meant you're going to get kicked off the throne when we look at the numbers like this the numbers add up to 62. so it's a play on words you got three numbers that add up to 62 but you also have this phrase that you're going to get kicked off the throne uh, let's see how all this works out together. Daniel comes to interpret the writing, and he tells uh, Belshazzar, chapter 5 and 22, You, his son, Belshazzar, you have not humbled your heart. Although you knew all of this, you lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven. So Belshazzar gave the command. Daniel was clothed with purple. A chain of gold was put around his neck, and a proclamation was made about him that he should be third in command. I bring that up because normally, do you guys remember Joseph was made second in command when he went to Egypt, right? Normally the king puts the guy second in command. It seems strange that uh, Belshazzar would put uh, Daniel third in command unless you know the background of the story where his father comes back from Arabia. So his father is there. He's the real king. Belshazzar is second in charge. And that means he put Daniel third in charge. Uh, third in command. That very night, if we look at uh, verse 30. That, so one of the other things, we know that puts us after 543, because that was when Nabonidus returns back to Babylon. Uh, that very night, Belshazzar the Chaldean was killed. Darius the Mede received the kingdom. And how old was he? Yeah. And that's the number that came up on the, on the wall there. 
<clears throat> Interesting stuff. Now, there's some historians that argue with the biblical account, especially if they don't like the Bible, and they'll say, well, it wasn't the Medes that invaded Babylon and defeated Babylon. It was the, uh, the Persians. It was the Persians. Um, so how that worked is, that's true, Cyrus, the Persian, and this comes from uh, that Greek historian. What did I say the guy's name was? Anyway, hmm? yes, ha why didn't I write his name down? The, he says that um, Cyrus was the one that drained, they, they diverted the uh, Euphrates different directions, and that caused the water level of the Euphrates to drop enough that his soldiers could get in, and that's how they penetrated Babylon, was just walking through the mighty Euphrates because they figured out how to divert the waters. So Cyrus comes in with his soldiers, defeats Babylon, but there wasn't even a battle, and this is where we get multiple corroborating accounts. This is in 539 that Cyrus actually takes Babylon... Uh, he gives it to Darius the Mede to control because we remember the Medes and the Persians, were the Medo-Persian Empire, they were both sharing the empire at the time. Interesting here is Jeremiah had prophesied this. Now, Jeremiah was prophesying back when Josiah was the king, so it's been quite a while, but Jeremiah 51, 39, while they are inflamed, I will prepare for them a feast and I will make them drunk that they should become merry. And then they will sleep a perpetual sleep and not awake. So Jeremiah had prophesied that about Babylon probably, uh, I don't know, 70, 80 years earlier. Uh, Jeremiah prophesied during the reign of Josiah. Isaiah had also prophesied about this. Isaiah 47, go down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughters of Babylon. Sit on the ground without a throne. Daughter of Chaldea, for you no longer shall be called tender and delicate. So there's something here interesting. Notice how he is comparing a great city to a woman, um, a woman to be desired, but after the city is overthrown, she's no longer tender and delicate. We might keep that in mind when we see a woman in the book of Revelation. Her Herodotus, here we go. The Greek historian Herodotus also documents this. Cyrus diverted the river Euphrates. His army waded into the city while they were engaging in a festival which was characterized by revelry and dancing. So tons of corroboration about the fall of Babylon. Pretty fascinating. That's it for Babylon. Now, since Cyrus has come in, uh, now everybody's under the Medo-Persian rule. And we know that uh, that happens about 539, somewhere right around in there. What I think is interesting about understanding the, the historical background is God has already witnessed to Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon, hasn't he? Several times God has shown himself to be the God that uh, is stronger than any other God. Now we get a new empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, and now we've got to have some more examples of God being the God of all the earth. So we're going to basically start over again with uh, Darius the Mede, and God is going to prove himself now to Darius the Mede. Chapter 6, Daniel in the lion's den. We figure this is about 538 B.C. Uh, you remember uh, the Medes now that have taken over are envious of the Jews that have been pro promoted to such a high place in society. And now Darius the Mede has also promoted uh, Daniel, because Daniel interpreted the writing on the wall. So the Medes are not liking this, and they uh, encourage Darius to come up with a law that they know Daniel is going to violate. They're not allowed to worship any god but the emperor. So Daniel gets wind of this new law. Check out Daniel chapter... Um, hmm, is it 6, 30, 6, 10? Thank you. Yeah, good job. Daniel 6.10, Daniel knew the document had been signed. He went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open towards Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed, gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. Just such a bold, in-your-face statement 
that, God, that Daniel was going to make everyone recognize, I have a God that I serve. I'm not going to hide that in any way. He gets put into the lion's den. Darius regrets having to do that, but he can't break his own law. And then in verse 25, Darius wrote to all the peoples and nations after he saw that Daniel wasn't harmed. And the languages that dwelled on all the earth, peace be multiplied. I make a decree that in all my royal dominion, people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. So now the, the, the Medes and the Persian, uh, the, the, uh, the Medes and the Persians are getting evangelized. Fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion shall last until the end. Then the scripture goes on to say, Daniel prospered during the reign of Daniel. Ah, Darius, sorry. <coughs> Chapter 7, Daniel is going to see a vision of four beasts. And I, I spoke about this in the sermon where Nebuchadnezzar saw the statue with four different parts. Daniel sees the same thing, but to Daniel, Daniel has a heavenly view of what that statue was and their horrible, ugly, hideous beasts that rise up out of the sea. Um, the lion, the bear, a leopard. And there's something interesting in this section that uh, as we're going to end the Aramaic section, right? We're going to end the section that is for the world so that all the Chaldeans and Babylonians, Medo-Persians can read it. How is he going to end this? Uh, in this four beasts, there is one where the, uh, the uh, oh, what was it? The Age of Ages? No. The Ancient of Days. Thank you. The Ancient of Days takes his throne and he exalts one like a son of man to rule the kingdom and his dominion shall be forever and ever Amen. And so that's going to be the close of the Aramaic section. All these kingdoms have come, but in the end, God is the ultimate king and he will last forever and ever. Amen. That's going to close out the section that's to the, the world. I thought that was pretty fascinating for him to end it in that way. Daniel's four beasts. Chapter 8, we pick up the Hebrew once again. And so from chapter 8 until chapter 12, it's all going to be in Hebrew so we naturally assume that this message is going to be uniquely for the Jews, which at this time are all exiled down in Babylon. Chapter 8, Daniel sees a vision of a ram and a goat. You notice there's no longer four creatures, four empires. Why would that be? Because Daniel is already in the time of the second empire. So the, uh, the ram is the Medo-Persian Empire, which is the one Daniel is in right now. The shaggy goat is the one to come next, and that's going to be Greece. The shaggy goat has a big horn. That's going to be Alexander the Great. And then there are four little horns. And if you know anything about history, after Alexander dies, he leaves his huge territory. Four kings split up his territory. So the big horn and the four little horns. Chapter 7, Daniel is praying to God because he's concerned that the 70 years, he's been reading Jeremiah, he's concerned that the 70 years is up and they're still having problems uh, over in Jerusalem getting the, uh, the temple built. Chapter 9, by the way, in... Uh, Daniel here, chapter 9, multiple commentaries have said, chapter 9 is the most controversial and difficult text in the whole Bible. I also, right? I also saw in some commentaries that Revelations chapter 11 is the most controversial and difficult chapter in the whole Bible. Uh, so there you go, that's that. You know... I wanted to share with you guys what I think. You know, I've brought up this whole uh, Eastern mentality and Western mentality. Which one do we have? Okay, Western. What was the Bible written in? Very good. The Bible is an Eastern document. And so it's so important that we don't read an Eastern document through a Western mindset. You say, well, what's the difference? Uh, chapter, chapter 9 Everybody wants to know uh, who is the king, when does it happen, 
how long does it happen, how much time. They want to know, it, it, most of the interpretations of Daniel 9 today is wanting the, the data. <clears throat> and so I was going to show you the difference. West, the Western mind looks at it, and it wants to know the data. <clears throat> Who is it? When is it? Where is it? How long is it? The Eastern mind would look at it, and the Eastern mind wants to know the Eastern mind says, hmm, what's the moral of the story? I think that that's fascinating as to why sometimes there is so much controversy over certain scriptures. It's because the Western mind wants to know the data, but the Eastern mind wouldn't have been as concerned with, okay, is that Antiochus Epiphanes, or is that Nero, or is that, you know, the Eastern mind says, well, what can we learn from this? What do we learn from this? Well, what we learn is nations rise. If they don't respect God and they're evil, nations will fall, and then nations will rise again, and if they don't respect God and they're evil, nations will fall, and in the end, God always wins. That would be the moral of the story. Uh, I think that's pretty interesting to finally see a, a kind of a hard example of uh, the difference between a Western mindset and an Eastern mindset. I think when we know something is uh, a story with a moral like uh, Aesop's fables, or better yet, uh, the, the turtle and the hare, the turtle and the hare. Nobody wonders who the turtle is or who the hare is. We just know that there's a moral to the story. That's the Eastern mind. Daniel um, chapter 9, uh, he's praying, and, um, and God shows him a period of time, and he's, he's wondering what's going on, God, because there's a hang-up over in Jerusalem. Now, what happened? Cyrus had already uh, let the Jews go back and start rebuilding Jerusalem. But if you remember the accounts of the rebuilding, uh, they're having a lot of difficulty rebuilding Jerusalem. Cyrus dies, and Cyrus' son is now king of the Persians. Cyrus' son is not favorable towards the Jews, and so all construction on Jerusalem stops for 20 years. That's about the time when, uh, was it Haggai? That's about the time when Haggai starts writing and says, hey, you Jews are living in your fancy cedar-lined houses, but the God of Israel has nowhere to live. You guys need to go get busy and start rebuilding the temple. So there's a period of about 20 years where they're not working on that anymore. And Daniel says, God, what gives? It was supposed to be 70 years. The 70 years are up. And, Daniel, and God tells Daniel, Daniel, because Israel has continued to be wicked, it's going to be 70 times seven years. So he extends what was supposed to have been the glory days of Israel. And he says, because of your wickedness, it's not going to happen when I said it's going to happen. 70 times seven. So you could either take that as Jesus saying you should forgive people 70 times seven, which means for as long as it takes. Or most people, again, the Western mind takes the 70 times seven as a period of 490 years. And that's fine because that puts you right about the time of Christ. But anybody that's ever done these numbers, it doesn't ever match up exactly. It, it's right around in there. About 500 years later is when Christ shows up. So interesting stuff. And then we get to the end here. Chapters 10 through 12, I kind of grouped them together. And there is a lot that goes in to all of this. Um, the chapter 10 begins by saying it was the third year of King Cyrus. That should be interesting to us because Daniel is still in exile in the third year of King Cyrus. But we know that in the first year of King Cyrus, he let everybody go back to Jerusalem. So for some reason, Daniel remains in exile. Uh, he's praying, he's fasting. And... Um, so chapters 10 through 12 talk about the difficulty that's going to be happening 
in the third and second centuries, all the wars and all the things that are going to come up. Isaiah had predicted this. Um, Isaiah 44 and 45, I would put those as a must read right next to this Cyrus in chapter 10 because Isaiah predicts exactly this. Uh, I'm going to read you Isaiah 44, 26. Who confirms the word of his servant and fulfills the counsel of his messenger? Who says of Jerusalem shall be inhabited? Now, Isaiah is looking forward uh, to this. He says, uh, Jerusalem shall be inhabited, band of the cities of Judah. They will be built up. I will raise up their ruins. He who says of the deep be dry, I'll dry up your rivers. He who says of Cyrus, he's my shepherd. He will fulfill my purpose, saying of Jerusalem, he shall be. Jerusalem shall be built, and of the temple your foundations shall be laid. So that's why I think we go back into Hebrew when we get to this section, because everything happening in, uh, chapter, in uh, chapters 10 through 12 is the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecies that Jerusalem would be rebuilt and the foundations would be relayed. Towards the end there, I think this is uh, chapter 10 and 20. Daniel is so perplexed and so grieved about what's going on in Jerusalem. Things aren't getting built. Chapter 10 and verse 20, he says, Then he said, Do you know why I have come to you, Daniel? But now I must return and I must fight against the prince of Persia. This is where Daniel is getting a glimpse that there are heavenly wars going on that have to be won before things on earth can change. There is something massive about those implications. This angel appears to Daniel. Daniel is still in exile under the Medo-Persian Empire. And this angel came to him and said, Daniel, it's taken me a while to come to you. I know you've been crying out and praying and fasting. It's taken me a while to get here because I've been fighting with the king of Persia. And he said, and when I get done fighting with the king of Persia, we all know that the, the Greek kingdom is the next one to come after Medo-Persia, correct? Says, and so he tells Daniel here, Daniel 10 and 20, and he says, um, I've got to return now and I've got to go fight against the prince of Persia. And then when I go out, behold, the prince of Greece is going to come in. So he shows Daniel this idea that there is spiritual wars, spiritual entities that are out fighting these wars that are happening on earth. Absolutely amazing. <clears throat> Ooh. Awesome. That is awesome. So you're going back to Chronicles. In 2 Chronicles, the pastoral optimistic view of history. Um, I forget if it was Elijah or Elisha. Okay. It's either Elijah or Elisha, but... Um, and I can't remember the king either. I want to say Hezekiah, but that's probably wrong. There, yes, it is Hezekiah because Hezekiah gets healed and he gets 15 more years. So God was blessing Hezekiah. He gets healed. Uh, so they're at war and Jerusalem is losing. I think it was to the Assyrians. Jerusalem is losing and one of the servants there is shaken in his boots and Elijah or Elisha feels sorry for the guy. And he prays to God that this servant can see the unseen. And when he prays, God opens his eyes. And it says, when he opened his eyes, behind the army that was encircling Jerusalem, behind that army on the hills was an army of horses and chariots flaming fire. So you're right. We have seen spiritual entities fighting battles for uh, earthly people before. That was a great one, Sarah. So the summary, if we boil it all down to you, what does Daniel tell us? God's rule is sovereign. God sets up kingdoms. God tears kingdoms down. The cliffhanger is that uh, 
Daniel was concerned about Persia's obstinance. Daniel is concerned that Jerusalem isn't being rebuilt because Persia is in the way. And the angel comes to him and he says, I'm fighting against those guys right now, Daniel. After they're done, the Greeks are going to come in. A godless ideology is to be resisted with godliness. And ultimately, God vindicates the godly with exaltation, and eventually the godless will fall down. That's about as far as we get. Daniel is confused and doesn't understand any of it. And he says, that's all right, Daniel. Close up the book. Seal it for now. This stuff is for far off. And you're going to go to sleep, and you're going to rest with your fathers. And that is the book of Daniel.